All right, this is part five of the right ventricle focused echocardiography. And we're just going to talk through some final helpful tips in right ventricular assessment. Now, we've kind of worked our way through this hierarchy of imaging the right ventricle, and we actually skipped over a couple of things. We, we didn't really talk about subcostal view to look at the right ventricular wall thickness, um, and we didn't really talk about the peristernal short axis view, which is really obviously great for looking at the septal paradoxical motion that uh, constitutes right ventricular pressure and or volume overload. So this is commonly discussed. It's not a hemodynamic measurement, so to me it's just really qualitative. Um, so, you know, you can talk about this if you want to do some of the more basic echocardiography, but once you start understanding Doppler physics, uh, to me the sign is not as particularly helpful as actually being able to quantify some of these pressures. Nonetheless, I thought I'd cover it here again. Just remember that you're getting this from a peristernal short axis view and we are, uh, in this situation, really looking a, a more significant flattening during systole in this patient, right? There is some flattening during diastole, as actually we see at the end of the clip here. This is still a little bit of a D-shaped left ventricle um, or flattened septum. But clearly, there's very significant flattening during systole. Uh, if I can pick it up, well, anyways, you can see that's happening here. I'm just going to keep clicking, and I'll stop clicking. So that's really more of a right ventricular pressure overload phenomenon. Now, when your right ventricle, or sorry, when your left uh, ventricle is almost always D-shaped and the septum is almost always flat, then you're talking about uh, both a pressure and volume overload situation. Now, this patient's right ventricle and left ventricle really aren't moving very well at all. Um, here, uh, I don't know how much different this is from the last one. I guess to me, this looks like there is a little bit more of a diastolic flattening than there is a systolic flattening, uh, but there actually appears to be a little bit of both in that image. So that would be considered right ventricular pressure and volume overload. Now, if you disagree with me, actually, I have found that the inter-observer reliability, this anecdotally, is not very good, which is why measuring hemodynamics directly uh, in the RV and the PA is much more helpful than these qualitative assessments of septal flattening in this man's humble opinion. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, subcostal view can be used to measure right ventricular wall thickness. This is most helpful for understanding the chronicity of right ventricular failure if it's present. So if somebody's got a thin right ventricle, which normally is 0.3 to 0.5 centimeters, and they have very significant uh, evidence of pulmonary hypertension, then you are dealing with an acute core pulmonary syndrome and not a chronic disorder. You recognize the slide from my diastology series. Uh, again, this was a peristomal short axis that I turned on its side, but this was a, a good way for me to illustrate uh, this concept. So when you're looking at whether or not the pulmonary hypertension and RV failure are due to left heart disease or not, one of the uh, best ways to distinguish that is to look at both your septal and your lateral E prime, prime velocities. So when patients have severe right ventricular failure without left ventricular disease, the septal E prime will be very low, i.e. won't move very much, but then your lateral motion will still be preserved, and your lateral E to E prime will be normal, suggesting that your left atrial pressure is normal. Now, this patient was not that case. In fact, this patient had both uh, lateral and septal E primes were low, and the E to E prime ratio was greater than 13 here. So I concluded this patient had uh, more of a left ventricular cause of their pulmonary hypertension, a diastolic failure type physi physiology. Okay, grading TR, you know, it's kind of the purview of the intensivist. Um, I don't think you'll be really asked to quantify tricuspid regurgitation beyond a qualitative assessment um, when you're working in the ICU. If you want to, you could actually uh, do some of these measurements sometimes with uh, the machines we have in ICUs, like trying to, to measure TR uh, jet sorry, TR severity by looking at something like the PISA uh, and calculating the effective regurgitant orifice area. We just don't really have the time or, or the equipment uh, to do that regularly in the ICU. So uh, what I have found is this qualitative grading scale for me works quite well. And when I measure it against uh, echoes interpreted by cardiologists, when I've gotten those to double check my work, I have found that this generally works. So if you're looking at a tiny jet, you are really talking about uh, trace TR. If you're seeing a jet pretty well, but it's not occupying more than a quarter to a half of the right atrium, it's mild to moderate. Um, if the jet's obvious, it's not all the right atrium and not all of systole, then it's moderate to severe. And then if there's a huge jet, you're going to call it severe to wide open. So it, let's look at this example here. The TR jet is actually visible, readily visible, um, as you'll keep your eyes fixed there. 
but it's not really gonna meet any of these moderate to severe. So this would probably be a trace to mild, actually. I can see it, it's not very big, certainly no more than uh, even an eighth of the, the right atrium here. Uh, there's not a big jet. Contrast that to this patient. So this patient, as you can see, actually, if you you know angle your probe a little bit, um, the jet comes out a little bit differently. So when I first was looking at it, uh, it didn't look very good, um, but it looked like a very substantial jet. Uh, substantial regurgitation. When I change the probe, you can see that this is now probably a moderate regurgitation signal that's occupying almost half the right atrium. So how about this patient? Should you bother measuring this velocity? Now here, this is probably, you know, a mild, right? I've got, um, this is a uh, RV, um, modified RV, apical four-chamber view. And you can see my RV looks a little bit dyskinetic here. Um, I'm not getting much of a jet here, though. You'd say maybe this is trace to mild, right? And it's coming through. Again, there's some swinging of the heart due to respiratory effort and changes in patient position. But at best, there's a mild TR jet here. So should I bother measuring the velocity of this? That's really only a mild jet. Well, if you've paid any attention to the first four videos in the series, the answer is absolutely yes. So every TR jet, you should measure it. You must measure it. Because even though it doesn't look like a very substantial jet, i.e. it's mild TR, the pressure is high. So the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation does not tell you very much about the pressure gradient. So this patient had preserved coaptation of their valve, uh, but they had a very high right ventricular systolic pressure. So my max uh, you know, gradient here was 43. And this patient, I can tell you from physical exam, had a CVP, a jugular venous pressure, somewhere in the 10 to 12 centimeters of water. Uh, so that means that this patient's right ventricular systolic pressure was north of 55. Uh, millimeters of mercury. So it was imperative to measure the jet because it's very clear the patient has significant pulmonary hypertension. Again, I mentioned this before. I think this is uh, the same video clip or perhaps a slightly different video clip. Again, sort of emphasizing that from the right, uh, from the apical four chamber view, you really have to finesse your angle uh, of your probe a little bit when you're in this view and to try to get the jet to come out maximally because depending on how you're looking at the jet, it may not look like very much and then it may change to occupy more than half the right atrium and you'd say, holy cow, that's actually a much bigger jet than I realized uh, with the first view. All right, so that's TR severity. Again, I don't put a whole lot of stock in it because the reality is I just want to know what my pressures are uh, when I'm monitoring and taking care of the patients and uh, just want a very gross sense of is the TR you know, wide open or is it mild or somewhere in between. Let's talk a little bit about how we use uh, ECHO to uh, monitor critically ill patients with acute pulmonary embolism. Now, ECHO is not probably not routinely justified in uh, managing and uh, prognosticating acute pulmonary embolism, but for those patients that are critically ill that end up in our ICU, it can be a helpful adjunct to uh, help with prognosis and help with management. So. Uh, as you can see here, this is an apical four-chamber view, uh, but this is actually McConnell sign in apical four-chamber. You can see that the right ventricular apex is contracting a little bit, but this is the uh, the free wall. This is more of the anterior free wall. Uh, it's not really moving at all. It's really completely akinetic. Um, so this is McConnell, McConnell sign. You don't have to get a four-chamber view to see McConnell sign, but obviously it's best visualized there. This is another example of that. The atria are being cut off here, but your right ventricular apex is contracting, lateral free wall not doing a whole lot here. So what are the findings that are helpful in acute pulmonary embolism? Um, if you're going to be using echo, you know, RV free wall dyskinesis is actually the most common echo finding in acute PE, and its clinical utility is pretty debatable. You know, if you look at enough patients, you're going to find RV free wall dyskinesis, and you might even find McConnell signs. Uh, but the prognostic utility of these first two markers is really not very clear. RV free wall dyskinesis can be seen in a lot of situations, so that wouldn't be helpful for identifying PE. Uh, but McConnell sign is relatively specific for acute PE, and when it's been studied in patient populations in whom pre, uh, acute PE was suspected, um, the specificity is actually quite high. It's over 95%. Now, if you took everybody with McConnell sign in a big echo database, not all of them are going to have acute PE. You know, some of your severe chronic pulmonary hypertension patients will have this as well, but it's pretty specific for, uh, for acute PE. The 60-60 sign is actually kind of cool, and it's really useful for distinguishing acute RV failure from chronic pulmonary hypertension. The 60-60 sign is that the pulmonary artery acceleration time is less than 60 milliseconds, but that the max RV systolic pressure is also less than 60. So what this would tell you is that the um, right ventricular contractility and, right, uh, and the pulmonary artery capacitance are both quite low, which you would see in acute PE, right? RV contractility is down, 
um, pulmonary artery capacitance is is um, low because there's huge clot burden and the, the vessels are already maximally dilated. But because it's an acute process, you can't really mount a significant right ventricular systolic pressure. So, you know, acutely the RV uh, does not generate much pressure beyond this 60 millimeters of mercury when faced with an acute afterload increase uh, when there's no diseased uh, RV to begin with. So you'd only see this 60-60 sign really in patients with acute RV failure, and most commonly that would be acute pulmonary embolism. TAPSI and S-prime actually, if, if you ask me, are the most prognostically useful and easiest to monitor in acute pulmonary embolism. So if you are using um, any echocardiographic data to make any sort of prognostic or therapeutic decisions about your patients who are critically ill with pulmonary emboli, uh, these are probably the most useful. And this is pretty well validated by a, a decent body of literature. So the, I have used these markers in patients in whom I've given maybe half dose lytics or catheter-directed lysis who are borderline unstable, you know, this can be a parameter that you follow clinically to ascertain whether your, your uh, therapeutics are working. I'll just wrap up with some things that are really out of the scope of uh, an intensivist when you're looking at the RV and pulmonary hemodynamics. You know, we really don't have the equipment to measure RV strain or RV ejection fraction. If you look in references, people can tell you how to do this, right ventricular fractional area change. I really just don't find it to be useful. Uh, RV ejection fraction to me is not very helpful for managing acutely ill patients. I'd be happy to look at uh, something that refutes that opinion, but I just don't see it being worth my time. The other thing that I really think is out of our scope is uh, we really can't confidently say the etiology of TR. You know, about 75% of TR is functional, i.e. it's just a function of a dilating right uh, ventricle. Um, but I think we're really not well positioned to make that call. So I think that's a type of echo that should be interpreted by a cardiologist and not an intensivist. The other thing I'd say is we really are not very good at commenting on pulmonic valve disease. Pulmonic valve disease really is within the scope of uh, a cardiologist. So I would have a lot of difficulty identifying pulmonary uh, valve stenosis if it were present on echo. Um, and I think if there was any concern for that or if the patient had a history of that, then that's a, an echo that should be uh, you know, interpreted by an echocardi uh, echocardiography trained cardiologist. All right, so some take homes. Um, I think really measuring the hemodynamics is the best use of our RV echo assessment. Um, and that's all I'll say. You can review the other four videos if you want more on that. Thanks.